many keys is a C minor seventh in? Come on, you're supposed to know that. How many keys is a C minor seventh in? How many keys is a C minor seventh in? All right, and of course, what I'm doing is uh, quoting the famous uh, Barry Harris, who passed away last week. And, uh, you know, I was a, a recent fan of Barry Harris. Hadn't heard of him really until a couple of years ago. Started watching his videos. And, you know, I find him very interesting. Now, to me, Barry Harris is what you call a philosopher of music. Oh, he's a great piano player and a great teacher, but he's really a philosopher because he gets to the truth of music and he gets down to not just what it is, but why it is and, and how it is. And like all great or many great philosophers, he could be a little difficult to understand at times. And, you know, if you were ever taking a theory test and they said, how many keys is C minor seventh in? You know, unless you had a little context, you might not come up with the answer right away. And of course, what he means is, is if you're doing diatonic, or I like to call them just scale tone seventh chords, like this in the key of A flat, let's do it real quickly here. A flat major seventh, B flat minor seventh, C minor seventh. The three chord is always a minor seventh. I mean, it is on a scale tone seventh chord. D flat major seventh, E flat, and so on. So he's asking then, how many keys does the C minor appear in? Well, of course, it appears in the, as the three chord in A flat. In the key of B flat major, it appears as the two chord. And in the key of E flat major, it appears as the six chord. So the answer there, Barry, is three. Um, you're supposed to know that. That's why he says when you're playing the bridge of all the things you are and you get to, or not the bridge, it's the last day section. Right there on, on C minor, you should not add a ninth because in the key of A flat, D is just not in there, right? It, it, it's, it's a D flat. So um, it's better to play the A flat uh, the C minor seventh, kind of as a substitute for the A flat major seventh chord, um, without adding the ninth to it. Now, does that mean you can't add a ninth to it? No, I mean, it just gives it a slightly more modern sound or a little bit more dissonant sound, or maybe it's just a little out, but you know, it certainly isn't gonna offend anybody, not in this day and age. Let's think of another song where it's very common on the three chord, to play a ninth, and that would be Satin Doll. This is the two chord, so we could put it in there. But how about here? Well, it sounds just fine. But why is that? It's because this three chord is not really functioning as a substitute for the one chord. It's kind of like, we're kind of in a new key here. First we're in the key of C, doing a two to a five. Now we're moving to the key of D and doing a two and a five. So since we're thinking of this and feeling this as a two chord, we can put in the ninth. Because see, it moves right to a D major. It's actually a D seventh. And then a D flat, which is like the tritone sub of, of G, right? So, you know, it's, it's a five chord. It's a sub for the five chord. Hey everyone, Tony Winston here for Jazz Piano College. One of my Patreon subscribers has asked me to say a few words about Barry Harris, and I'd like to do that. So most of you probably know that Barry Harris was a great piano player, and I think he's a musical philosopher. And he passed away last week at the age of, I believe, 91 or 92. Uh, anyway, I, I want to just... There's been so many videos about what he taught, and I'm not going to go through it all right now, but I'm just going to give the, my three main takeaways from, from what I learned from Barry Harris. And one of them is this kind of old trick. I'm sure he didn't invent this. I guess we call that a hack these days. All right. And I've just found this to be so useful whenever you're doing any kind of a diatonic progression. You can call this scale tone seventh chords. And 
Really, just this morning, I was re-watching a few of his videos, and he was talking about, you know, when you do... Like that. That these notes right here, he's borrowing it from the diminished chord that you use, like, in block voicings. You know, when you go up like this. So when you just play the C chord, and you put this in, you're just borrowing from the diminished. And when, when you play the whole diminished over the C, it really sounds that way. You know, there's not much difference. This is a little more sparse. And uh, then he went on to play, I don't know, I think it was all the things you are, and just putting those diminished things in everywhere, like, um, I think he went like, did something like, you know. doing some things like that. So that's one thing, and I found it useful recently in a song uh, called I'm Old Fashioned that goes. Right in here. And right here is another Barry Harris idea, and that is comes from the family of dominance. And uh, the way he explains this is very, very interesting. So right there, I'm moving towards the four chord, and that's kind of my new key center for the moment. So we can think of this D minor as a three chord. And I did a video about this recently, motion, um, you know, how harmonic motion going from the three to the two. All right, so just pretend like we're in B flat here. So from the three chord, we usually have a diminished chord there. It, it could be a seventh chord too, but uh, a diminished chord is useful. And then we're moving to the two chord. Now, out of this diminished chord, if you lower one note from the diminished chord, you will come up with a dominant seventh chord. Let's lower this one. You see, we got C seventh. Now, this works for every note of the diminished chord. If you lower this one, you get E flat seventh. If you lower this one, you get F sharp seventh. If you lower the top one, you get A seventh. And every one of those dominant seventh chords can be used instead of that diminished chord. So if you're going D minor, F sharp seventh to C seventh. Now think about F sharp seventh. Does that n normally lead to a C chord? A C no, it n normally leads to a B chord. But here, because, and I, I don't know why, you know, it's kind of like mathematics. There's, you can get the same answer, but you can get to it in so many different ways. And the way Barry gets to it is pretty interesting. So we're, we're on our D minor, uh, we're moving to a C sharp, we're gonna make that F sharp. Instead of C sharp diminished, we're going to make that F sharp seventh, and that moves really beautifully into C minor. You know, other songs where this happens is uh, like Beyond the C. Now let's look at some of those other ways. A seventh works great. C seventh. Ah, that's pretty rich there too. I think I covered them all. Anyway, um, I've, I found that aspect of his teaching to be very, very interesting. The family of dominance. One thing I've never seen him cover, I don't know if he did or not, was just the fact that those dominant chords can be just interchangeable. Like uh, my arrangement of um, Round Midnight, I do it like this. All right, now right here I'm going from C minor 7th flat 5 to F7. But what is in the family of dominance of F7? Well, it's all the dominance that are, you know, a minor third away. So F, D dominant, B dominant, A flat dominant. So here's what I did. I went to D dominant and then went to F dominant. And it, I think it sounds great. I'll play it again because you need to agree with me on this.
some interesting chords there. All right. I don't think anyone on the planet has ever played that for a B-flat uh, alter dominant. Anyway, and my third takeaway from uh, Barry Harris's teaching is just the fact that you can add half steps to your lines to make them come out right. Now, um, I think he calls them half step rules. And this is not something I've gone really deeply in because my my uh, right hand improvisational technique is already pretty well cemented. And I kind of have done it so much that I don't need these formulas or these these uh, techniques to make my lines come out right. They just tend to come out right because I've done it so much. But if you're doing something like, by adding a half step like that to the Dorian scale, and of course this is the C bebop scale is what I'm using, I come out on a chord tone. All right, if I didn't do that, well, I still come out on a chord tone, but sometimes I wouldn't. Like right there, you know, it'd be better to come out there. So if I had done, or maybe this, then it would come out right. And that's one reason why I say come out right. I just mean that, you know, the strong beats have chord tones and the, you know, the other tones are in between the beats. But really, I mean, I think if you if you play like that 100% of the time, your playing is going to sound very kind of, I don't know, pre-programmed or something. It's not going to sound very natural. So this is one reason, though, why the diminished scale is such a great scale, because it's an eight-note scale. You know, if you start here, you're going to end on the same note. You know, start here on the beat one. You're going to end on that note, same. Right? And so it's a scale that tends to work out uh, pr pretty nicely. You know, it just, it just lands you on nice notes. Does it work all the time? No, it doesn't. So, and you know, like I say, there are these half step rules that you can use to make your lines come out right. But the thing is, is when they don't come out right, you can make them right. Like for instance, uh, uh, all right, that one came out right, but suppose I don't put that half step in there. All right, I just come in on the and of four. And that's Barry Harris's favorite beat, the and of four. <laughs> you know, he doesn't want any drummers going click, click, click on four, but da 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 click da 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 and one two and three four and one. That's okay. He's good with that. Um, personally, I have nothing against a click on four, but you know that's just a personal preference there. I guess you could say three things. His analysis of harmony using the, what he calls the, uh, what does it call it? The diminished six scale or something. We call it the bebop scale. And you know, it's so super useful for all this uh, block chord voicing. So if you're into that, you wanna understand Barry Harris's teaching on that. Then there's melodic ideas. I was listening to a video this morning where he was talking about like a triplet on beat one. Like uh, Donna Lee, you know. That's not the line, but it's something like that. And he was saying, well, come in on the and of floor, four and then do the triplet. So one, two, three, four. So one, two, ba, da, 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 da. Uh, two, two, ba, da, da. Now, that was obviously not really the melody of Donna Lee. Learning songs like Donna Lee, uh, orth ornithology, ornitholo ornithology, anthropology, any of those ology songs, 
those are like bebop solos. So if you learn the heads of those, and you kind of need to know those if you're going to play with other jazz musicians, that kind of teaches you how to play in that style. Uh, it gives you some of the scales that you're going to need. And, uh, you know, you could take them just like I did and just start kind of messing around with them and make them your own. And pretty soon you'll have some somewhat of a bebop vocabulary. <laughs> kind of embellishing <laughs> Donna Lee. Anyway, the great Barry Harris, musical philosopher, harmony, rhythm, and melodic ideas. He was an expert on all three, and uh, sorry to see him go, but he certainly has left behind a great uh, legacy uh, with his playing and his uh, many videos, and just all the people that remember him and have done uh, honorary videos about him recently and uh, have covered his uh, material pretty thoroughly. So thank you, everyone, and I'll see you again very, very soon. <laughs>